In this podcast, we chat about the win against Millwall, look ahead at the Tees We Are Derby, and answer your podcast questions. This is the Borough Breakdown podcast, and this is all your Borough Master Chatter in a pod. One support. Curtis Fleming is there on the edge of the air. Fleming for What's Craig it? Hignett. Hit it, Higgy. Higgy hits the track. Avanelli coming alive again. Janino wants the ball played to him. Avanelli spots out. Hello and welcome to the Borough Breakdown Podcast with Johnny Dana and Tom. We are the Borough Podcast that gives you all of your Borough match day chatter in a podcast. And four wins in a row for Borough move Borough up to fourth place in the championship table. Guys, the word four it seems to be the word of the day. So I'm going to ask you uh, how are you feeling in four words. Uh, Dana Malt, how are you feeling in four words? We are insanely mint, are my four words. And I remember the reverse fixture at the Den against Millwall. And we had this big conversation around the application of the players and not having any leaders. I mean, that conversation always seems to pop up anyway. But the second goal that we conceded that afternoon, Zian Fleming's second, it was just a, a real lack of responsibility being taken by the players. Nobody owned up to that situation. It was a set piece, nodded back at the, at the back post, I think. And, and he was completely free. So there was just a, a general lack of responsibility being taken and control being taken of that set piece. And yesterday it was the flip opposite of that. There were players that were taking control of the game. Johnny House in the second half was fantastic. Dale Fry headed everything away. Some fantastic interceptions and tackles from Tommy Smith. So, and they were they were just three players really. It was just a a, a nice flag in the sand that Borough planted yesterday of the progression that we've seen. And and I can't believe it really. I mean, seven uh, wins in eight under Michael Carrick is is really impressive because I think he's beyond his new manager bounce now I would say that's the first five or six games but I think yesterday was his 12th so it's really impressive how he's been able to turn things around at Middlesbrough um, it seems like we are uh, I don't want to say the real deal but this is more than just a, a flash in the pan you know this is the Middlesbrough that we're seeing now and you know we deserve to be where we are which is really good Tom uh, so my four words would be had to be tough. Um, I thought yesterday Millwall played, I mean, I mean, you said it in our group chat yesterday, Millwall played exactly as you'd expect Millwall to play. They're always a, a tough team to play. They're always a physical team. Uh, the ref seemed to be happy to kind of like let the game go quite a lot, which was absolutely fine, but it was a very physical game. Um, and I think lesser teams could cave in that situation i think if your if your mentality is not all there it could get into your heads that you know you you're getting battered at, at, at times but i think it, it kind of really uh joins up with what Dana was saying there about everyone kind of taking responsibility there was no one who wasn't up for the up for the challenge yesterday uh everyone played extremely well kept their their focus on the uh on the targets and i think even when we went one nil up and Jake Cooper ended up getting subbed off for them. I think Millwall could have easily crumbled as well, but it seemed to serve more of a, a wake up call for them. Um, and then they spent, you know, large spells on, on the attack from, from there, I would say, but we defended really well and res uh, really resolutely from there. Um, and again, just, just kind of goes to show the, uh, the mentality we have. I think Dale Fry said it in his, uh, <clears throat> post-match interview where it says everyone's really focused on getting that clean sheet. Um, I, I think, you know, credit, to, to everyone for, for getting that, uh, getting the lead, keeping hold of it and, and coming back with a free, well, coming back, we were at home, but, um, coming away with a free point, uh, yesterday. Um, yeah, no, no, I agree with you both. Like, it was a um, really good display yesterday. Um, but the four words are going to be a, a clean sheet, Don. Um, I think yeah, it's, it's always really good to, to have a clean sheet. And, you know, I think after the Millwall game, it was, why is our defence so rubbish? Why can't we defend anymore? Um, this is We need to improve on this the most. And, you know, to get a clean sheet after that is, it kind of nullifies the comments that, that, that come out. But, 
I think defensively we were we were okay yesterday. Um, a very sensible display. Really. I think it was, although it was a good win, maybe I'm, I'm taking it for granted a little bit. But I just felt it was just dead sens- sensible. We played reasonably well. Everyone played like good, but like it was at a good where like no one was a massive standout. It was just like everyone was was good on the day. They did the jobs and. And um, we we were really professional in how we played, and we were able to break a, a tough middle wall side down um, in that compact shape that they were in. And it was really really good, and it shows uh, credentials that we can break teams down, and also we can rally when we need to when the game starts to go their way, and we're able to, to come away with the three points. But uh, Tom, how would you assess the overall performance against Millwall? Well, like I said, they were a, a difficult team to play against yesterday. I thought I, I do think they're uh, they're doing really well this season, and it shows. Um, I was on the uh, Millwall podcast uh, opposition preview show the other day, um, and what they'd said to me was their away form kind of was really up and down this season. They never really knew which Millwall they were going to get uh, when they go away from home, um, and they wouldn't have been surprised if you know they they kind of turned up expecting the draw. Uh, they said, you know, obviously everyone always wants to win, but I can see us kind of setting up for to try and take like a draw and, and just get a point from this game. And I would agree with that that assessment. It did seem like that yesterday. They did have chances, but I don't think they they really threatened us too much. Um, I never kind of really felt like we were in a, a lot of danger. There was only one point in in the first half. I think it was where I can't remember which of their players it was, but was allowed to run through the middle um, with with no one kind of like really closing down, kind of stepping off and closing down the angles and the shot ended up going straight at Zach Steffen. Um, But that's kind of really all I can remember them, them doing. That said, it it took a lot for us to, to break them down. Um, And again, going in nil, going in nil, nil at half time, I did think that, you know, we're going to come out second half better for it. And then we've spoke about it before. It's it's just a feeling I'm regularly getting now with with Borough. Uh, even if we're going in like a goal down, knowing that we can come out second half and, and turn it around. I didn't think Force was having a good game first half. And as well at, <laughs> at half time, I was thinking he's going to come back out and have an absolute like blinder here and probably end up scoring. And <laughs> and he did. Like, it, I don't know. It's, it's weird with Borough at the moment, like going in at half time, someone could be having one of the worst games you've ever seen and have not that force was any uh, yesterday anyway, but just knowing that they're going to come out completely different second half. Um, you know, we kept, we kept pushing, uh, kept trying to break them down. Um, got that goal eventually. <clears throat> and like I said, as as soon as we got that goal and and Jay Cooper went off injured, like in the, in the next couple of minutes afterwards, it could have gone two ways from there. It could have been that we continued on and um and and you know got that second and and, and kind of carried on in, in that um in, in that way. But it it really did seem to to be a wake up call for them, and I think it it showed two very different but good sides of our game yesterday the creativeness to, to get the goal in the first place but also like i say the resoluteness to to hold on to that lead and and, and keep the clean sheet as well i want to come back to the 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 first half and the second half or vice versa and how Bora are able to to influence games in in different halves well come back a little bit later on we talk about the form but then i just want to hear your thoughts as well because another another win for Bora seven wins out of eight like we, we mentioned at the start it's something that we're really building on but how would you like assess things as well i just want to pick up on something tom said there about you know force and him playing out wide there's just parts of his game that shouldn't click but they are like crooks up front mm. force out wide um at pom playing in that deeper role it's just all very good at the moment and i think we saw yesterday a different part of our game we have been playing well but I think we played a little bit of the ugly stuff yesterday and we had to dig in. I think Dale Fry said it after the game, it's always going to be uh, ugly against Millwall because they make it so. And Borough negotiated that really, really well. They were set up in a, a very structured 4-2-3-1 and at times a 4-3-3 um, out of possession with Zian Fleming and, and Vogel Sammer sort of trying to 
to push on, but they weren't really pressing. They were more cutting off those passing avenues to House and Hackney, who tend to have a big influence on uh, proceedings and basically progressing the ball through the third. So I think at times, Borough, you know, we had to be patient. And there was a lot of impatience around me in my seat in the East Stand. I didn't quite understand it because as Tom touched on there, we are, are a good team at coming back after the break and really seizing the game and stepping it up. And I wouldn't say that that's because we've been poor in the first half. It's just, as I've mentioned before on this podcast, the natural progression of that football match. And we saw that yesterday. We did have to stick it out and we did have to be incredibly patient. And I'm glad that we saw that yesterday because it's just a different side to our game that we saw. And we 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 did negotiate it really, really well. So I'm glad that we saw that yesterday. Um, and, you know, when we needed... That moment, we got that moment through force. And and I will say, he's part of my praising place, but Chew Bratpon was absolutely brilliant yesterday. He didn't score, but when I'm saying there, they basically shut out that middle part of the pitch and the influence that House and Hackney had. You saw Akpom time and time again drop deep, try to link the play, give the likes of Paddy McNair and Dale Fry the option, and Tommy Smith as well, which, of course, we we scored from the situation of Tommy Smith feeding into Bratbom, who dropped deep at that point. It was just a really, really professional, as you said, Johnny, performance that ticks yet another box um, for Michael Carrick. Yeah, um, and it, like, that professional side of things, you know, with games aren't, going, aren't, going, aren't always going to be exciting. You know, you need a bit of patience in games. And I think I can understand why why fans get frustrated because you want to be heavy metal football. You want to have so many chances. You want to score 30 goals in a game. There'll still be some of that mourns at the end of it. Uh, but, you know, it's it's the aspect of, you know, you've got to calm down and understand that it's, it, it is processed sometimes and you've got to just play through games. And you might not always get the right result on the day, but over time it'll compound and, and you'll hopefully try and get something good in the long run, because all the Boroughs underlying numbers have been good this season. It was only a matter of time. You have to understand what process can we do a tweak here and there? Can we change the environment and improve with Michael Carrick? And we have started to to get results. Um, but I was intrigued yesterday uh, by Millwall. And, you know, it was just like professional performance and how Millwall set up and how we we speak about shape. And when we, you were saying that then about 4 2 3 1, I, I found that Millwall were in a, a, a 4 4 2 for long periods of the game yesterday. Um, in a four four two, where uh, you're looking to try and have compactness um, with with it out of possession, so what will happen is you, you, you're nine and you're ten, or the four three one, or sometimes a four three three, because you can you can adapt your shape um, with a four four two, because it is can be quite flexible in how you how you operate it to be. But it gives you a nice balance, and that balance um, and what Millwall were trying to do yesterday was to create a mid block, um, enforce ball out wide, control the central areas, and interestingly, when you do have this type of play um, in, in, in motion. You have about four, five, six players in the box when Bora try and cross the ball in, get the ball out, keep it nice and compact, nice balance, and just try and force Bora, uh, you know, to try and play through. And Bora did that really, really well yesterday. Um, and what you will find found in, is in Bora's shape is that we probably weren't in our, in a standard 4-2-3-1. And you won't sit in, if you look at Bora's shape, for, for all of the games no Michael Carrick, we we don't really play for a 4 2 3 one It's more, it's still a three at some points in the game where you've got Tommy Smith, um, uh, Dale Fry, and, and yesterday was Paddy McNair occupying that three. What really interested me yesterday was how high uh, Ryan Giles was up the pitch. And Borough were technically playing a 3 2 5 um, for more, more periods in the game. And you can see this with a lot of teams this season with more possession based teams that are looking to try and occupy this 3 2 5 space because one, you can help play through the lines, and two, you get your wing backs forward. And also, you try and get the ball uh, into the, the mid third and through the lines of what they were playing with a 4 2 3 1. The downside of a, a, four, a 4 4 2. Um, or four two three one at times, it can be really strenuous in midfield, um, because if Bora are trying to pass the ball from side to side, which they did, they had sixty six percent possession yesterday, eighty five percent pass success. Once you try and get from ball to side to side, you've got some space in behind. If, if the gap between your centre back and your centre midfielder is a little bit too big, you've got the likes of Chu Brackpom, you've got the likes of Ryan McGree to try and get in behind in those little spaces. And you'll get the ball through the middle, and then you try and get the ball out wide. So then you're stretching a team nice and out. 
And then from that, you're able to get the ball in the box. You've pulled a couple of defenders out, and you should have the space in the middle to to get a to get a shot away. Um, but with Borough's goal yesterday, I uh, obviously we'll come to it in, in just a moment. Uh, then what we found that yesterday, get the ball in the middle, get the ball out wide, stretch the midfield out, and then hopefully you'll get in behind and create a chance from there. And Borough did that really, really well yesterday. But Borough's shape is really interesting. We could do probably a little bit more on it in the next couple of podcasts, but. Borough shape is is being really good. We cut co- we combated that that four four two four two three one shape that Miller were trying to occupy, but they just came yesterday. They came for a point, fine for them to come for a point. It's a really it's a difficult place to come for a team really in, in form. But the way that they play was just very balanced across the pitch. They didn't really want to give too much away going forward. They didn't want to give too much away going in behind, and they were happy just to sit in, get the ball in possession uh, get on on the on the on the press from McNair, or if someone gave it away midfield, they were able to press with numbers and get forward. But Bora really, really good yesterday in limiting that. But in terms of Bora's play, Dana, it was a game of patience because, like we were saying, they're the compact shape nature of it. Um, they're looking to try and make frustrate Bora, get the, win the ball in certain areas. The press was really key on McNair yesterday for, for periods. Um, but how were they able to, to break through in the second half? I think it was just a culmination of that patience, really. Housen really impressed me in that second half because I think he was dropping into the space between the lines a lot more that allowed the progression of play through the thirds. It allowed the defence to have an option there, uh, much like, you know, at Pom dropping deep from an attacking position. I think Housen was getting into those key pockets and... We were good at, and we have been good under Carrick, I have to say, at picking up those key areas of football match and dictating the game based on space. And Housen in that second half managed to do that. And I think he was imperative, really, to obviously the goal because it was his ball played to Marcus Force that just cuts through Millwall. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But I, I also thought Millwall tried to step on us a little bit more in that second half. And I think because of that, Bora were able to maybe pick them off a little bit more. In the first half, they were sat back, they were sat in, they tried to contain us. And I think they probably had Bora in less dangerous positions and less dangerous areas of the football match, which I think at halftime Gary Rowett would have liked. He probably would have wanted to see a little bit more attacking venom from them. But at the end of the day, I think he was by large limiting Borough to areas of the pitch that they would want to. But then in the second half, I did notice they tried to step on us a little bit more. And then Borough were able to play through that because of, you know, at Pom, the influence that he had on the game. And then also Housen just honestly took the baton and said, I'm going to seize control of this football match. And he absolutely did. And he was brilliant in that second half. Um, And the goal just epitomised the the patience and we got our just rewards for sticking in that game dominating possession making sure that we were the ones that were in control um in the driver's seat and it was i think personnel definitely impacted that uh second half influential players stepped up and yeah bora reaped the rewards from that yeah, and they did uh, reap, the, reap, the, reap the rewards. That was such a handful to say. Um, <laughs> That's with, why I with, slowed it right down. With, and I was, as I was saying, I was like, this is really difficult uh, to, to <laughs> get out. Um, but we did uh, get the breakthrough, Marcus Foss, um, the wonderful Marcus Foss. Um, I'll finish the light. Um, <laughs> Dana, do you want to take this goal breakdown because it was a, a good goal for Borough. It was nice to see that they're coming in, in and out from the midfield, get the ball in behind. He does get, to, does get a little bit of luck from the, the deflection, but it's a lovely, lovely goal, isn't it? Yeah, he earned it, to be fair, um, with the run that he made and Borough's play in general in that move was really good. I feel like we're collecting a lot of good goals under Michael Carrick. I come in here and I break these goals down. And I'm like, I really enjoyed that goal. I just feel like I'm, I'm seeing that a lot more. But I think Borough were trying to break through as I said you know very structured out possession with Millwall and, and our main avenue of attack was through those wide areas as they do tend to be under Carrick but our midfield influence our attack through the middle of the park was down on what it tends to be it doesn't tend to be particularly high percentage wise anyway but 19% of our attacks came through the middle which is lower than the past two home games and because of that we had to try to dictate the game and dictate our attacks through those flanks and also the half spaces as well and what you saw 
with the goal. It is absolutely brilliant from Chibrat Pom. He is playing at such a high level at the moment where he can drop deep. He takes the ball. He commits four players to him because at one point, I think it's Sean Hutchinson that comes over to him and then eventually ends up trying to take Marcus Force, who's making that running behind. But you've got three players, Vogel Sammer, Callum Styles, and I don't know who that third person is, but three Millwall players on him there. And that just opens up space that Johnny Housen uh, receives the ball from Chew Bratpom, who's backed into these players and uh, gives the ball to Housen. And he just it just opens up so much of a good area for Housen to thread that ball through to Marcus Voss. And he sees that opportunity and he takes it. And Marcus Voss has obviously made that run in behind. And it's just what I said there about trying to attack the key spaces of a football match. Chew Bratpom has opened up that avenue for uh, Johnny Housen to be able to play that pass. It is absolutely brilliant number 10 work from, from Chew Bratpom, who, again, I will say, Although he didn't score, he was pivotal to not only that goal, but that win. Because his game, dropping deep, trying to pick up those pockets of space, trying to take players out of position, it was really good to watch. And then, obviously, Marcus Foss gets lucky. I think he decks um, Sean Hutchinson with a shot. I think it knocks him over, <laughs> such as the, the the sheer force of Foss's shot. And, you know, he it was a fantastic finish with his left foot through the legs of Callum Styles into the corner of the net. It was just a really, really good goal that, you know, Borough, we see this quite often with trying to get in behind and um, at Pom dropping deep and uh, influencing the game that way. It was a really, really go a good goal from us. And I was so glad that it was scored because I was freezing in that game and I wanted to get up so badly and celebrate a goal. Um I think the West Stand had two goals to celebrate, didn't they? Because they were celebrating the one in the first half that did not go in, which was um, such a sight to see them all celebrating and then realise it wasn't a goal. But yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. And Marcus Voss, um, you know, getting in amongst the goals. It's it's working. Him out wide is working and he can't drop him because he's getting in amongst it, which is, is brilliant to take that bit of a burden, if you could say it's a burden, off um, Chew Bratpom. Yeah, um, to be fair, Dana, the West will get their, uh, get their own back on the East. Uh, you know, it will happen. It might happen <laughs> on the north side, north side but um, it will happen. So you can enjoy that moment while you can. Uh, you've been an East, East End uh, resident, but in the West, I feel like the West Enders will, will come back with a vengeance at, at some point. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, like, like we were saying, on, on, on the goal and around space and how can we attack space? And we've seen that in, in many, many games. It was like I was mentioning earlier. How can we generate space from the central areas to get the ball out wide and get in behind and occupy and attack attack space? And we've seen a lot like Akpom coming in, bringing defenders with him. What does that, what does that do? It generates space in behind. So trying the one to get it out wide. And that's how we find a lot of our success. Um, and Marcus Foss was was deserving of his goal yesterday. But he has been, uh, he has took his eye Jones' place uh, in the squad, uh, in, in the 11. And he wasn't even in the squad yesterday as I Jones. And after the game, Matt Carrick said that, uh, we just pick up, pick the squad for how we see it. He's fit. He, we just want to get him back playing well, look after him and help him and get him back to his best. Tom, what's your thoughts on that? Because it was interesting to see him not in the squad yesterday. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's interesting man management from from Carrick, and I think recently he's probably had a, a couple of the. I just want to say the first real test because I'm sure there's been others. You know, he had to pick up, pick everyone up as soon as, as soon as he came in recently. Uh, really, but um, yeah, I think he's had a, a couple of interesting challenges recently. Um, you know, making sure that the the squad weren't too downhearted and heads didn't go down after the the Brighton game. But also, Jones has hadn't really been himself for for a few games and. I, I feel like he's got that most of the most of the season from uh, some, you know, some sections like on, on Twitter and stuff like that. And generally, you can kind of look at his stats and say he's only been only got slightly less in terms of goal involvements than than last season. So he is still being effective, uh, even if you know people are kind of saying he doesn't run at people anymore. He doesn't kind of take on his man beat him anymore. He's just playing a, a different kind of game um that said like i said the the last few games he hadn't really been playing uh to the best of his abilities and in, in, in my opinion um and 
it, it's interesting to to kind of drop him, give him some time out of the team to to hopefully kind of come back firing. Um, we all know the ability he has. I don't think for a second this is his character saying like, oh, he's he's done, or you know, we're we're going to get rid of him, uh, at, you know, in January or anything like that. I think it's just it's an interesting way of, of kind of managing uh, Jones, and and hopefully it, uh, it it works well, and he comes back into the team and and, and kind of shows you know back back to his uh, his top form. How do you think he, he gets back into the side then, Tom? Uh, obviously, we had a question from Dave McNally, which is the same question, but how do you think he gets back in? Well, hard work. Um, I think he's got to show it on the, on the training grounds. Um, I'm, I'm sure he, he will. You know, he's he's got the attitude to, to do it. And I, I don't know, maybe he just needs to kind of like get out with his own head. Um, you know, it, it did seem like sometimes when, when he's trying to take a man on or you know put across and he's he's overthinking it and trying a little bit too hard um so yeah just just hard work on the training ground and you know hopefully that time out will will do him well and i'm sure he'll he'll get his chance again to to get back into the team and you know just need to take it when he does playing a devil's advocate then do you think it could be a sign that he might be out the door in january or do you think it's just a resting no, I don't think he'll be out the door. I mean, we've got very little options on the right anyway. I think potentially that might have played a part in the decision to put Marcus Force there to start with. Although that could also just be he saw something in training, much like how he did with Chuba Pom and thought that Marcus Force could play that, that right wing role. But I don't think he will be out the door. I just can't see that happening because... Jones, when he is on form, is a very, very good player and he's a very dangerous player and he's a very good weapon to have in Borough's armoury. So taking that away, I think, in terms of the squad would take away a very good option in that squad. And I don't think I don't think he'll be off. It, this is just how he reacts to it now. And as Tom said, in training, in cameos that he gets if he gets on the pitch against Sunderland it's how he reacts to that you know Carrick has given him a, a mission here basically uh, to to respond and and Carrick's not afraid to to drop players is he I mean he, he dropped Cristiano Ronaldo he, he was the first one to see the light before everyone else did so yeah it's um I think it's good I would say it's good man management from Carrick he was honest but he wasn't brutal and it's just they do want to help him get back to his best. And sometimes you just need to almost reset. So hopefully we could get Johns back to, you know, the form of last season. But remember, as I said last week, it's a different setup. It's a different manager. It's a different formation, different tactics. It's not going to be exactly the same, but um, hopefully we could get him back and, and performing well. With someone who's been absent, but I want to talk about someone who's been ever present. Um, that has been for, Probably 200 games now. Um, it's still Fry. Um, 200th appearance for, for Bor yesterday. It feels, God, like, I can't believe it was like against Preston under eight or Karankri made his debut. That mm. feels like, feels a long, long time ago. That, um, <laughs> but, you know, he's, he's still really young still. He's got a lot of wealth of experience. Um, but he's, how do you think he's been playing as of, as of late, Dana? Because he seems to slowly come back to his best again. Yeah, and I completely forgot that he was out of the team at the beginning of the season. It was mentioned to him by Mark Jury on BBC Tees yesterday. And it's really weird to to think that because, I, you know, when I think of Dale Fry over the past few seasons, I have thought ever present. But he spoke incredibly well after the match yesterday. And I was pleasantly surprised by that because in the past, I think you've probably heard Dale Fry talk like a young player, you know, much, much like how you you hear of quite a few where it just sounds like they don't want to be a part of the interview. They're just saying as little as they can to try to get out of it. And in a way, I feel like his quite self-assured interview yesterday is in turn a way of, you know, it, it sort of feeds into his performances on the pitch as well because he has really grown. He's a lot stronger, a lot more of a physical presence. And this really started last season, I think, think or probably the season a little bit of the season before under Warnock where he was really stepping up and standing out in defense he was absolutely fantastic yesterday the amount of times that I saw Dale Fry just leap in the air and, and head the ball away was 
brilliant. It was ridiculous, but it was brilliant. And he was absolutely fantastic. I think in terms of um, aerial duel percentage, 71% won, which I think was quite low compared to what I thought it was and what it was yesterday before Fort Mob updated their stats. But it was uh, just a really strong performance from him. And if it wasn't for House in the second half display, I would probably say Dale Fry man of the match. But just such a, a, an assured person as well as an assured player. You know, I think they go hand in hand there. So really happy to see Dale Fry. I was there for his debut against Preston in that away end, a deep deal. I think it was nil-nil. Um, and he's just grown massively. It, it, I think, admittedly, for him, it probably has taken a while because he was on the periphery a lot of the time. He wasn't quite the main man in defence, but he's absolutely the main man in defence now. And, yeah, really happy with his performance. He was brilliant yesterday. He was. Um, but let's move on to Bora's form. But actually, you know, just before we do that, I want to give a, a little plug for our merch at the moment because as a few a lot of people are aware that we've we partnered up with uh T Side uh this season and, and all of our merch that we what that T Side make goes to um, the Morton Urency Association, so everything that you uh, you, you buy um, goes one hundred percent of it goes to the M and D A, which is really cool. Um, but our merch is pretty amazing. We've got some shit house uh, Island uh, t shirts, the Malt Curse t shirts, some board breakdown hats, some mugs, um, and much much more. And we've got some stuff coming um, in the next couple of weeks. And how can you find that? Well, if you look um, in your podcast provider or in your um, video in your description on YouTube. Um, the website will be there. But if you listen to us and you're thinking, hmm, how do I go there? It's t-side.co.uk and then forward slash collections and then you'll find the board breakdown stuff uh, there to click on it. Like I said, 100% of it uh, goes to the MNDA and that helps us raise over £3,000 uh, for the Morton Urine Seed Association and that is really, really cool. Um, now let's let's chat about Boris Farm then, shall we? Because seven wins in eight, four wins in a row, 2.2 points per match under Michael Carrick. Tom, um, last week it was all doom and gloom. 5-1 defeat to Brighton. They went on to beat Liverpool yesterday. Three goals to nil. Um, so much for it's only Brighton. Eh? Um, but are you, are you glad with how well Bora reacted uh, yesterday? Well, firstly, I'll, I'll say at least we scored, so we are clearly better than Liverpool. <laughs> but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, re- really happy with the the reaction yesterday. Um, I, I think I was I was a bit wary going into the game uh, after that five one loss. I think there's a couple of ways that it could potentially go after that. It could just be the, the heads are down, and you know it, it does take a while to to pick back up. But it seemed very much kind of business as usual yesterday. It was like. Like Carrick had said in his uh, his uh, press conference, like everyone was just kind of told to forget about it, move on, and and you know we we go again in the um, in the championship, and it definitely seemed that like that that was the case. Um, I didn't see any kind of hangover from that that loss yesterday, and like I say, very much business as usual. So that that is giving me confidence in this team, and you know confidence for for the next couple of games as well, which are, are going to be really tough. Are you surprised about how well we've we've been able to turn this around? Because, like, and obviously take take the Brighton game out because that's just a one off. But from where we were in October to now, it's incredible, right? You, it, no one could have seen that coming. No, I don't think anyone could have. Um, I know us three were didn't really know what to expect from from Carrick when he came in. He was a a, a bit of an unknown um, unknown quantity really. Uh, we'd only really kind of had his his three matches in charge of Man United to go off, but the way that he set us up tactically, but also managed to to pick the players up, get the you know improve the the team cohesion, and you, you can see it on the pitch now. Um, you know, after after Forster's goal yesterday, I think it was only Zach Stefan who wasn't up the pitch. You know, ninety <laughs> yards, <laughs> ninety yards away from him celebrating, which you can you can understand. But everyone went and joined in with that celebration. You can see the the togetherness of the team and the way we're set up now. The football we're playing. I think I will say I knew we could do it because the team that we built for the start of this season. It was clear that we were going for for promotion or playoffs with the team that we had, uh, and and we've been assembled to to play possession football. 
we obviously weren't playing that way under Wilder at the start of the season because uh, of all the uh, individual mistakes and, and stuff like that. Uh, really, I think it was only individual mistakes lined with, with one person by, uh, by the looks of it now. But um, yeah, we knew we could do this and it, it's, you know, credit to Carrick and the, and the coaching team that they've been able to, to bring it out of the players and, and really kind of turn it around from from where we were what 21st 22nd in the league to to now and i said on the um on the millwall podcast the other day like we've got millwall sunday and wofford in the next three games if we come out of that with you know at least six or seven points but ideally you know if we won all nine if we come out of that with with three wins i would be extremely confident for for the rest of the season and and that that is just absolute credit to, to Carrick because I think one of the things that keeps coming to my mind now is one of the questions that we had after uh, Carrick was appointed where it's like if you could take 15th now would you take it I'd said no at the time um, I, I said yes <laughs> I'd said no at the time thinking I, I wouldn't want to kind of limit us but I didn't think you know, we'd be where we are. I, I thought, you know, se- sixth, seventh, eighth, that that sort of area. But I, I didn't think at, at that point we'd, you know, in, in what was it, twelve games time, be fourth in the championship. That's ridiculous. Yeah, um, and I feel like you need to mention as you were you were talking there, you did do a quotation mark, um, and I just realised people that <laughs> listen to us will have no idea that you did a quotation mark about individual errors. But we'll we'll let that slide. But um, yeah, on 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 the turn it around, uh, Dan, where do you think we can go now? You know, obviously you said that you were happy with fifteenth at one point, but now um, where where do you think we can go for the rest of the season? I think we'll be in the top six. I'm fairly confident in saying we'll finish there. Um, I don't know whether I'm going to jinx it or whether I should maybe calm down my confidence there, but um, I just think the championship is crap. To put it bluntly, and I—I I mean that's not that's no slant on Bora. I think Bora have been brilliant, and that's why I think we'll be in the top six. But yeah, I, I think we can get into the top six. Whether or not we can win the playoffs, I do not know. Um, I'd be wary of certain teams, but I think the way that we're going, obviously, we're still going to endure some bumps. It's going to happen, but I think I'm pretty confident in just the whole ensemble that we have right now under Carrick. He's very calm. He's very assured. I think he's a manager that if we do get beat we can react fairly well so um yeah I think we can get into the top six and you know where we place there third fourth fifth six I don't know um second maybe I don't know I, I still think that second place is up for grabs um not quite now but I do think Sheffield United will have a little bit of a wobble but I do think we'll end up in the playoffs I'm I, I'm not usually confident I must admit I'm usually I err on the side of caution I'm quite pessimistic at times as well but I do think we'll get into the top six come the end of the season yeah, I do as well. Um, you know, it's 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 a weird league, the championship, but it's still like four or five points separate, like the uh fourth to about thirteenth or something silly like that. Yeah, it's um, mad. We'll have a look um and we'll confirm that, but I could be wrong. Um but yeah, it's it's you know, obviously it can be a slide the championship, but I think we've been really good um over over the last few weeks. How how can we not have been good, you know what I mean, to to win seven on the last date? Um, the way we're playing, like you've, like Tom mentioned as well, like he's been able to pick this group up uh, from the despair of the relegation zone uh, to now, and it's it's really really promising. Um, but we'll move on to questions now because every week you get to send in uh, your questions, and that's via Twitter at the board underscore breakdown, um, or email at the board breakdown hotmail dot com, or by joining our Telegram chat, um, where there's over two hundred ninety four fans talking everything. Probably but Borough, um, as per usual. Um, but we do have a good laugh on match days as well. Um, but the first question uh, is from Yaj, and it's on, it was on Twitter, and he says, um, why are so many people giving Stefan a hard time? It's justified. Uh, I like him. Miles better than anything we've had for years. Really good distribution. A little suspect on crosses, but, we'll t- but he'll take that. Um, Tom, why are so many people giving Stefan a hard time? I, I don't know why. I, I don't know why, but we'll, what do you think? 
I have absolutely no idea. Clearly unhappy with the clean sheet that we had yesterday. But um, <laughs> to, to be fair, that's, that's not all on Stefan. Um, but I, I think it's it's literally just because of the new style of play that we have and, and playing out from the back and uh, you know trying to play through the press. I'll be fair with criticism. I think Stefan made one bad decision yesterday. Uh, and I think it was playing at the house and when he had about three players on him on the edge of the box. We did make it out of that situation, but it was it was a bit nervy, and I think that's kind of amplified when when you're a goalkeeper and you and you make a mistake like that. But in terms of his distribution, that is absolutely key to our our game now. And I get that you know there's still a certain amount of supporters who would like to see us just boot it long from a goal kick, but it's it's not what. A possession-based team is kind of built on, and we are clearly confident in playing out from the back. Um, and I think Stefan's a, a massive part of that. I think what people would see is if you know, if if we go into next season and you know we haven't extended his loan, we haven't signed him or anything like that. Uh, I have absolutely no idea what uh, Solbrin's distribution's like. Um, but, you know, we're hearing how highly rated he is. Potentially, he could come into the team next season. I think you would notice a, a, a real difference in the way that we play out from the, the back under under a lot of other goalkeepers. Let's not forget, he's came from City, had the same sort of coaching, and, and he has the same style of player as Edison, who is... For me, one of the most enjoyable goalkeepers to watch, just for his his distribution. You know, he, he might not be the best shot stopper out there or anything like that, but for for the way that City play, he's absolutely key for them. The same way we want Stefan to be key, key for us. The the very similar in, in that respect, and I think we we replace him with a another goalkeeper. We notice a difference. There's other teams in the championship now, I think, try to do the same thing. Uh, Swansea being a, a good example of it, but none of their goalkeepers are on that same kind of level as Stefan distribution-wise. So, yeah, I, I understand you know, why some people have mini heart attacks when when he's trying to play the, the ball out from the back, but at the end of the day, it, it, it's key to, to what we're trying to do and He's very good at it, so I, I don't enjoy re- reading the uh, the criticism or hearing it in the stands every game. It just gets on my nerves a little bit. It's like that John Stones syndrome, isn't it, when he was at Everton and he was playing the ball in risky areas and he was not launching it as Everton fans were typically used to see. And it's like this newness that's kind of scary and it latches on that anxiety of a football fan but there's no other goalkeeper that I would rather be in between the sticks playing the way that Carrick wants than Zach Steffen because he is brilliant at his distribution he will ping those balls with such ease towards that you know right or left hand side and where I can play from there I think a lot of people feel like he's I don't know what the word is maybe lackluster or a little bit um Thing like Lacks Lacks or yeah, like. yeah, like that. But I think it's just him being a because he's because he knows that w- what he wants to do and he's calm in it and, he, and he's assured. And I think people get that mixed up with him being laxidaisical and and things like that. But yeah, I'm I've done a, a full one eighty on Zach Steph, and I think he is a really good goalkeeper for us to have in terms of playing out from the back. Where I'm a little bit cautious of is his ability to command his area from balls in the box we saw a situation yesterday where he tried to to punch it out and it sort of hits hits his thumb almost and fortunately for Borough it doesn't end up in a goal for Millwall but that's probably where his weakness is his strength is his distribution and to put it simply people that have these nerves around Zach Steffen are just going to have to get used to it because you can say bring Liam Robertson if you bring Liam Robertson he will crumble playing the way that Michael Carrick wants so he's the first part of our attack obviously the last line of defense but he's so important he's integral even to the way that we play so I like Stefan I will defend Stefan now even though I was not a fan of him earlier in the season because I've I've seen the way that we play it's clearly how Michael Carrick wants to set up this team and he's good he's good in it he's he's going to make mistakes it's going to happen but what I really love Carrick saying yesterday is 
when there's those nerves, when we do have a little bit of a wobble, just keep at it. Bora far too many times on and off the pitch have hit that big red reset button. And as a fan, I'm sick of seeing that. So I am loving the fact that Michael Carrick is drilling into these players. Keep at it. Trust this process and we will benefit from it in the mid to long term. So hats off to Carrick for that. Yeah, and, and the way Stefan's plays as well, it, it's all about break and press and creating space for our wingers to get forward. And, you know, and playing out from the back is is something that, you know, all, all the all probably the best teams do now. Um but it is, you know, you know, it's been this principle from 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 a few teams now. But in terms of like how Stefan's distribution is really good, it, I never see him give the ball away, which is mad, even if it's like uh, like a long kick or the, the short kick playing the ball at the house and yes, which you know I think we're house and try to play it back out of fry. He takes three men out of the game, we will get forward in, in behind of that. But you know, it just didn't really work out yesterday. But House did actually ask for the ball. You could see him like like really asking for it to try and spread out. But um yeah in, in terms of Stefan like we can manage like his weaknesses ever so slightly I think with our defenders as well because when we go off across just play a little bit deeper. Do you know what I mean? Like just to make sure we can get the ball away from uh, from Fry and, and Lenahan try and command it that way. Um, and you know, there's, there's like, I don't really understand to be honest the why people frustrate, are hate and frustrated. But for me, uh, he's a he's a good goalkeeper. Um, you know, I'd take him on a permanent any permanent any day. Um, and he's really, really, really good at what he does. But in terms of like Liam Roberts, yeah, like you were saying that, Dana, distribution was poor from Roberts, but is he commands his box well. So it's like, what do you want from a goalkeeper? If you want to play a possession style, then off to Stefan if you want to play a team that tries to beat a press with more of a long ball then then up to Roberts but both equally good goalkeepers the pros are different for for each goalkeeper so it's how you ever want how you want to see it and how you want to play the game it's highly dependent on what people's opinions are but I would opt to Stefan uh next question um it's from uh Ben and he says would you give Housen another year, even if we're looking at longer term replacement? Um, won't be many better squad players. He's not showing any signs of aggressing under Carrick. Um, Tom, would you give Johnny Housen another year? Well, yeah, because he, he still seems to be like aging backwards, really. <laughs> He's not really showing any signs of, of the age that he, he is and, uh, you know, getting on. Um, and that, that's not to say getting on like Maddo was saying, Paddy McNair was getting on yesterday at the right old <laughs> age of 27. Uh, I'm pretty sure Housen's uh, 34, but um, no, he, he still seems as as kind of good as uh, as he ever was. And he's he's got a different role in the team than I, I think he, he would have been promised when we initially first signed him all them years ago. But he, he's still... You know, the, the, he's still playing to to that championship standards. You know, he, you'd still be a bit wary if he was out of the team and say more came in for a game or something. You'd be like, "Oh, is house and okay?" And I think that it just goes to show how well he has been playing this season. So, yeah, I think as as long as he can, as long as he can play, and as long as he can go, give him another year. Yeah, um, like like Barry Bannon at Sheffield Wednesday, uh, he just keeps on playing, um, and he keeps getting better every year. But Housen, yeah, I would next year if we're gonna keep him about, you know, what I mean, we have got to re- like replace him. I think to some extent, you know, what I mean, like when we were playing against better opposition, he he does get found out a little bit, but you know, it's it's normal to to have to have that. But um, yeah, for me, we've got to try and replace him, then keep him around the group. Um, because he, I think he does a lot off the pitch than he does on it as well. Um, and then the final question, Dana, it's from Charles, and he says, Which team do you fear the more stopping us? Uh, if, if we get into the playoffs, mine will be West Brom at Jalvian. Um, who do you think? Dana. I agree with West Brom, I do, because when Corbran took his Huddersfield team to the Riverside last season, he did a job on us, and I think he's the type of manager that can be flexible with the game plan and, and sort of use it to combat the opposition. So I'd be wary of them, but also Watford, because Watford have the best player in the league in João Pedro, who I know is out injured at the moment, but will probably be back if they get into the playoffs. And our record at Vicarage Road is bad. I was looking at it, two wins in 11 games there. The last time that we beat them was 2012, when Scott McDonald came back out from the cold. Uh, Marvin Emner scored, and then Scott McDonald got the winner in a 2-1 win. So... Yeah, I think West Brom and Watford. 
for me. Yeah, it's really difficult, isn't it? It's really difficult this year. Um, Tom, it, it would be your uh, just uh, your fear. Well, I definitely agree with West Brom, and for the same reason Dana's just said there, Corbin's a fantastic manager, and I would be worried against uh, about coming up against him again. The other one, which might be a, a little bit out there at the moment, but having seen the way they played under a new manager yesterday, I would think if they're getting a new manager bounce and going on to the end of the season playing like that, they might be a bit of a worry for anyone in the playoffs is Norwich. Um, I think, you know, under Wagner yesterday, they won 4-0 away at Preston. Some of the goals they scored were, you know, absolutely fantastic. And I think it's it's a very similar case to what I've said about us when Wilder left and Carrick uh, had came in. Those players don't become bad overnight. There's there's something else going on there. And then to, to look at the way they played yesterday, you know, Pookie scoring again and, and stuff like that. Um you know, eventually they're going to pick up and start play, playing to to their full potential again. So I, I would say that that would be a worry to to anyone in the playoffs. But it's it's just the case now, isn't it? That you know, teams picking up form at the at the at the right time going into the end of the season. So you know, will will they maintain it? Will we maintain it? You know, who knows? Mm. Okay then. Well, let's move on uh, to the present place then, because the present place is the place we like to give praise to a fan of coach uh, T side Tom, our Tom Dynamo uh, on BBC T. Johnny Buller. Much... No, I'm not giving myself praise. I have to earn it first um, <laughs> on this. I, I need let, let me present this first, and I'll give myself praise afterwards. But um, <laughs> on the present place, then who are going to give praise to uh, Dynamo? Who is your person in or person or thing or anything in between um in your present place today well i already said mine earlier didn't i too brat pom um the championship player of the month despite not scoring yesterday he was just really really good much like how i said uh, last week about his performance against Black, uh, blackburn i always got to say blackpool instead of blackburn but brilliant you know it didn't score but still just patches and stitches up those patterns of play. You can tell he knows exactly where his teammates are and he is so, so influential on this unit. So, yeah, for me, it's it's too brat pom. Um, the loving with him is just absolutely brilliant. It's so wholesome. There's no no more popular goal scorer than too brat pom. And I know, obviously, he didn't get on the score sheet against... Um, Millwall, but still hugely important to the way that we play. So, yeah, Chew Brat Pom gets in there. Tom, who gets your place this week? So, for me this week, it's Dale Fry. I uh, thought he was absolutely excellent yesterday and really um, embodied that resoluteness I was on about earlier, uh, where we were hanging on to the lead. He was getting on to getting his head onto absolutely everything. Um, and what I will say as well, you know, he's been playing since Luton with a face mask on, and I think it, it's easy when you when you're playing football and playing through through an injury to kind of shy away from things. Um, you know, Johnny, I'm sure you'll have have stories of playing with injuries as well. But thanks, like, mate. I've, thanks for the I've, dig. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've played like, Abby over here. I know, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say I've played with like broken fingers before, and I think it's tempting when you're trying to block a shot to like stick your hand behind your back or something so you're not getting in the way. But for him to be playing with a clear facial injury and still wanting to get his head onto everything, I think that just shows just like such a, a bravery on the pitch. And it, it just it doesn't look like that actually affects him at all. Um I think just add on to that that yesterday was his uh two hundredth game. Just I thought it was absolutely phenomenal yesterday. Mm. He's like a six foot Dale Mysterio with a mask on, isn't he? Um, <laughs> but, yeah. oh, he's bigger than that. I've never felt so small as to when I've stood next to Dale Fry. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, he's definitely at all taller than six foot one, and either Mark Baller. But um, <laughs> just want to go on on the warm up watch yesterday. Mark Ball is not six foot one at all. Um, <laughs> but uh, in in terms of my present place, I'm going to go with Marcus Foss. Um, in on the goals again, I love Marcus Foss to bits. I think he's great. Um, he's just really, really good in the box. Uh, and I know, like, I, you know, I know he was a development signing in in, in the in the summer, and you know, we didn't expect him to maybe play one or two games um, and go out on loan and play his trade, um, even though he'd been playing in the Premier League in the, the prior season. But uh, 
Um, no, he's <laughs> he's been really, really good. He's been really good. Um, just the way that he can come in on the, uh, uh, the back of back of the box, but then also um, getting getting behind and really manipulate defenses, and it's really, really uh, good to see. And I also think we should um, like create a chance for 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 Marcus Foss. But like, you know, like uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Ted Lasso is Jamie Tart. Marcus Foss. It is catchy and it will click on. It will catch on. I'm telling you right now. Um, but anyway, uh, enough for the present place. Let's look ahead to the teaser with Davy then, because we do have a, a show coming later on this week. Um, with Graham from What the Folk podcast, um, where Tom you'll be presenting and giving a full lowdown on the game. Um, but in terms of where Sunderland are this season, they are tenth in the Championship under Tony Moore, but they had a few injuries, a couple of suspensions here and there. But they're eighth in the form table with two wins, two draws, and two defeats from the last six. Um, but a more in-depth show coming later on in the week. But we'll do our predictions right now. Um, how are we feeling about this? Because the game on Sunday has a probably quite a bit riding on it now. Obviously, the start of the season when we played them the first time, we were looking for a win, and then we finally got one under Chris Wilder, and we played relatively okay on the night. Um, but it was a, a big relief to get it. But now we're fourth and just absolutely flying. Uh, Dana, what's your prediction against Sunderland on Sunday? Ooh, I'm nervous about this one because I feel like although Sunderland are, are going well, I know obviously they got beat uh, yesterday, but I just feel like form and league table goes out the window with these games that have a little bit of bite. I don't care what Sunderland fans say, there is a narrative behind this game. It is a derby, although it's not the derby for them, it's still a derby. I'm nervous but then I'm thinking, why should I be nervous? Because we've seen progression under Carrick, whereby, as I said, even if we get that little pushback, we can bounce back really well. So I've got a start on the screen that I'm not going to say because I'll be bringing Don't back the malt curse. I'm not bringing Don't back the malt curse. But I think we will... I, I'm. I'm sort of nervous and confident at the same time it's very odd but yeah I think we will get the win I don't think it's going to be um, a swashbuckling display I think it is going to be tight for me I'm going to go with 2-1 Middlesbrough 2-1 Middlesbrough for Dana we could, you could tell me this this um, this thing you don't want to mention Dana I can call it the bullock bet if you want and we'll uh, say put this on because it's probably not probably going to happen um, <laughs> shall I send but, it to you you can I may I might I might put it in at the end. Who knows? Uh, Tom, uh, what do you think? What's your prediction? I'm also going to go with 2-1. I agree with uh, what Dan has just said there. I think form and uh, everything else can go out the window in in a derby game. Um, For me, I just see Ross Stewart scoring against us after we've been linked for him for both transfer windows this season. But I, I also think the... The kind of calmness um, that we've got in the team now, like that cohesion, um, I, I think that will. Um, I would think that will come into it. I think Carrick will have them set up for this game as if it was any other game, and I, I think we'll. Uh, I think we can. We can get the win. Okay then. Um... Yeah, I think we'll. I think there'll be goals in the game. Uh, Dan, I'm not going to say the stat you've just sent to me because um, it probably won't. It probably will happen. Uh, but I yeah. think Borough will. Will if if you're not if you're listening to this listen to this podcast or you are viewing this podcast, let us know what you think this curse potentially could be. Um, but in terms of, of where I think it'll be, I think we'll probably win. Um, I'd, I'd probably take a two-one as well, you know, a three in a row for us. Uh, all three, t- all, all three of us saying two-one. I can see Sunderland scoring. They are playing quite well under Tony Mowbray. Um, Ahmed Diallo has been sensational for them over like the last few weeks. Patrick Roberts has came into a lot of form as well, and it's a sh- it's, it's quite nice for us that Ellis Sims has gone back to Everton and got a lot of smoke yesterday. Uh, mm. for just for just being there for like five minutes, but. Um, <laughs> It's uh yeah, I'm glad that he's kind of went back because he was he's a big big problem uh for us uh, if he was to play, but I'm glad he's not. Um, but yeah, I think we'll win two one. I think they've got a couple of injuries as well, so I'm hoping um we can get something there. But Danny Bart will be in the squad at centre half, and you know he, he's bound to have a great game since he's a, a Borough connection as well. And mm-hmm. you know Stuart will probably score. 
Um, but, you know, hopefully we win. But, guys, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining me, as always. The listeners and the viewers, thank you very much for watching us and listening to us. And thank you for giving us 600 five-star reviews across Apple Podcasts and Spotify. We really do appreciate all of that. But if you haven't given us a review, please do. That helps us get found and other Bora fans find us and um, get us up the podcast charts as well. But that's it. Bora win four in a row, seven wins in eight. Marcus Foster, do, 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 do. Marcus Foster, do, 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 do. it's been the Bora Breakdown podcast, and that was all your Bora Master Chatter in a pod. Up the Bora Breakdown. <laughs>